Welcome to session two of MoveMot and Field Distributors Basic and Intermediate Training. In this session, we're going to start getting ready to get a MoveMot set up and ready to run. We're going to talk about the different connectors, switches, and dials, and we'll talk about how they're wired up. Let's get started. First of all, let's take a look at MoveMot's construction. All MoveMots are basically put together the same way, regardless of their version. Of course, we're focusing on the version D, which is the current one that SEW Eurodrive sells, but older ones are put together the same way. A MoveMot has three basic parts to it. There's the conduit box that bolts onto the motor or bolts onto a mounting plate that mounts near the motor. This isn't a standard motor conduit box. It's actually a specialized conduit box dedicated to Movimot. It's a little deeper and has a special shape. The second part is the control head. This bolts onto the conduit box with four bolts and it comes apart. You have to take it off in order to configure it. And then finally, there's a gasket that sits between the control head and the conduit box. This is very important because this is part of the IP rating system that keeps out dust and liquids, so never omit the gasket. Before we do anything, I want to give you a few guidelines about the control head so you can handle it properly and make sure that it's performing as it should perform. First of all, and this is absolutely crucial, before you do anything, disconnect power either through an appropriate lockout tagout method or by physically disconnecting it in some way and then wait at least one minute before removing the control head. The reason you have to do this is because there are capacitors inside the VFD that can hold a charge for up to a minute. These capacitors can be charged up to as high as 700 volts DC, and they can definitely give you a nasty shock if you touch them. So I'm going to just stress this again. Opening the control head without waiting can result in a shock. You've been warned. After a minute, you can loosen the four mounting bolts in the corners and pull the control head off the conduit box. When you put it back together, though, let me emphasize that you do need to torque these bolts to a specific torque. They should be torqued to three newton meters using an appropriate torque tool. There are a number of plugs, both on the control head and on the conduit box. These two must be torqued to a specific torque. They must be torqued to two and a half newton meters. This is essential to maintain the IP rating. And here's something else I should mention. The gasket between the control head and the conduit box should be replaced after you've opened the conduit box, especially if the MoviMod has been closed up for a long time. The reason for this is because the gasket can develop a memory, and when you bolt the control head back down, it may not seal properly. A new gasket eliminates this problem. This is necessary for the IP rating. So if you're working in an environment where the IP rating is especially critical, that is a dirty or wet environment, then replacing the gasket is a very inexpensive way of ensuring that the MoviMot stays sealed up. Okay, so those are the guidelines for the control head. Incidentally, in case you're wondering, the bolts that secure the control head to the top of the MoviMod conduit box are metric 8 bolts, so you'll need a metric 8 millimeter driver to remove them. Moving on, let's talk about the different electrical connections you make inside the conduit box part of the MoviMod. You will see this when you remove the control head. This is a circuit board with a number of terminal connections on it. There's also that connector at the very top that mates with the control head. Let's talk about the different connectors. We'll start with these big ones here, the ones marked L1, L2, and L3. These are the connections for three-phase power. So this is where you connect up your line power. So just make connections there. You notice there isn't a protective earth or ground connection here. It's in another location, and I'll show you that in a minute. So connect up your three phases, L1, L2, and L3 here. Connections 13, 14, and 15 are used for the brake, a brake controller, or a braking resistor, depending how you're setting up your particular motor. If you have a brake, such as a BE brake, it can be controlled directly from these terminals. You would disconnect up the red, white, and blue wires. If you're using a braking controller, like the BES, BEM or URM, you would make some connections to here. You would also possibly make connections in another location, which I'll show you later. 
And then of course the brake would be wired up to those. If you're using a brake resistor, because you have a motor without a brake, you would connect it between 13 and 15. 14 wouldn't be used. An internal brake resistor would go within the conduit box. An external one would have wires that would lead outside the conduit box. There's actually a lot of possibilities and connection combinations involving brakes, brake controllers, and brake resistors. Now, all the remaining connections are low voltage connections that operate around 24 volts DC or less. And I'm going to introduce this topic by telling you how you need to make connections here on the colored terminal blocks. If you have solid wire or you have some kind of a sleeve or ferrule, you can just push them straight in. But if you have stranded wire, you need to push the little release mechanism above with a small flat bladed screwdriver in order to insert the wire. If you don't, the strands will just go everywhere. To remove any type of wire, press the release and pull the wire out. All right, the first connection is for the 24 volt power supply. Remember I said that Movimot does require a 24 volt supply. This provides the electronics with electricity. You can use a 24 volt factory supply that's available in your facility. You can connect an external power supply, or you can use one of the Movimot power supply options that derive 24 volts from the line. It's up to you. Just make the connections here. Now we have the digital inputs. These are labeled F1 and F2, left or counterclockwise, right or clockwise. These are digital inputs that respond to 24 volt logic. So any kind of 24 volt logic is fine. You can just take a simple switch connected to a 24 volt power supply. You can use relay contacts on a PLC or controller wired to 24 volts, or you can use PLC 24 volt logic digital outputs and connect up to these. It's your call. These can be used for binary control of the Movimot. We have the RS-485 port here. There are just two connectors, RS plus and RS minus. You connect this up to a shielded twisted pair cable, and that will go either to one of the SCW accessories, like for example, the set point adjuster, or they will go to some kind of RS-485 network that is being driven by a bus master, like a PLC or a digital controller of some kind. Connections K1A and K1B are relay contacts. This is a low current, low voltage relay connection. You can connect this up to a power supply, 24 volts, for example, and use this to drive an indicator or some kind of digital input. It's up to you. Just be aware this is a small relay, so it's not meant to deal with high voltage, high current. You can look in the manual to get its exact ratings. And then finally, we have two connections here, HT1 and HT2. These don't go to anything. They are called intermediate terminals. They're used for certain wiring options where you just need some connection points to make convenient connections. In most cases, you would leave these unconnected. There are a few more connections, as I told you, that aren't on the circuit board proper or weren't visible in that picture, so I want to show you those here. I'm looking down into a conduit box with that circuit board installed. The first connections that are important are right here. These are the two protective earth terminals. Remember I said that when you connect up your power, the three phases connect to the L1, L2, and L3 connections on the circuit board but you need to connect the protective ground wire, which is green, and you can see one on the left side there, to either of these PE terminals within the conduit box itself. Now there is one additional connector which is on the circuit board, but it wasn't visible in the picture in the previous slide. It's right here, it's the X10 connector. If you're using the BES or BEM brake controller, it has some connections which would attach here. It would also make some connections to the 13, 14, and 15 terminals as well. So that takes care of the remaining connections in the conduit box. Now, an important note. I'm not going to demonstrate how to wire up a brake controller or brake resistor because there are several ways to do this depending on the type of brake controller, the type of brake, and the type of brake resistor. Really, there are just too many ways to demonstrate, so I'm going to refer you to the manual. It has wiring diagrams in it, and you need to follow these for the particular equipment that you're using. Now, let's move on to the control head. It has a number of dials and switches that are used to configure its operation. 
In our next session, we're going to show you how to do this in what's called easy mode startup, but I want to cover these here, so let's look at those. If you look at the top of the control head, there are a number of connections there, actually two. They are underneath plugs that you have to remove, and let me remind you again, if IP rating is important, be sure to torque those correctly when you're finished. On the bottom, we have what's called the F1 dial. This is a potentiometer. You can rotate it with your fingernail or a screwdriver. It has numbers on it. It goes from 0 through 10. It also turns smoothly, so you can set it in between numbers. This dial does one of two things depending on your control mode. If you're operating in binary control mode, it establishes one of the two speed set points. So you would turn this to a position that would select the speed, and I'll tell you how to figure out what speed you're going to get from each number. If you're in RS-485 mode, this sets the maximum speed, because in RS-485 mode, you have a continuous range of speeds between a minimum and a maximum. This dial sets the upper limit. If you turn it all the way to 10, it'll go as fast as the VFD can drive your particular motor. But if you want to limit the upper speed, you set it to a number less than 10. Let me also remind you that you can buy that little knob accessory that attaches here. This allows you to control the speed while maintaining an IP54 rating. You might use this, for example, if you're using your Movimot to replace a mechanical variable speed drive that has a continuous range adjustment and the user who's controlling the application changes it frequently. If you use that little knob, you can do that. If not, you're going to just set this and then put the plug back in and you won't change it again. So there are several ways of controlling the Movimot with this dial. Underneath the second plug is a connector. This is what's called the diagnostic or engineering connector, and you can connect one of several accessories to it. You can connect the DBG60 keypad or one of the USB adapters, which allow you to connect your Movimot to a PC for engineering and monitoring it using MoviTools Motion Studio. We will demonstrate that in a later session. So that's what you find on the top of the control head. If you flip the control head over, you have a lot of things underneath here to set up. First of all, there is that connector that mates with the matching one on the conduit box. Then we have a dial here. Now this dial turns with clicks. It's numbered from 0 to 10 as well, but you can't set it to the intermediate positions. You set it to each click stop. This is called the F2 dial, and it does one of two things depending which mode you're operating in. If you're working in binary mode, it sets a second speed set point that the drive can run at. And if you're using RS-485 control or an RS-485 accessory, it sets the minimum speed the drive can run. You won't be able to run at a speed slower than what's set on the dial. If you want to go all the way down to the absolute minimum speed, set it to zero. But if you want to cap the minimum speed at some higher value, set it to a number greater than zero. The white dial is also a clicked dial that goes from 0 to 10. It is called the T1 dial, and it sets the ramp. That is the motor acceleration and deceleration, the rate at which it will speed up and slow down. There's just one ramp, so acceleration and deceleration are going to be the same value. You set it with this dial, and later on I will be showing you how to figure out what the numbers mean. There are a whole bunch of dip switches used to configure the Movimot. We'll be going over how to set these. These give it great flexibility in how it operates. In easy mode, all you have to do is set the dials and switches, and that's it. You don't have to connect a PC or use a keypad or anything like that. We'll be covering that in our next session. And then finally, there is a little removable module called the Drive ID Module, or DIM. Now you may wonder, what's the DIM all about? Let's talk about it. There are many DIM modules available. What do they do? They tell the Movimot how to control the motor that it is attached to. SEW Eurodrive has many different motor models and sizes. Movimot needs to know the particular motor that it's attached to. So the DIM module matches the motor. If you order the motor with the Movimod, it will come with the correct DIM module. If you've taken a Movimod, attached it to a motor, and it's maybe a different motor than the Movimod was purchased with, you're going to need to change the DIM module to the right one. How do you know which one to use? 
Well, they are color coded for specific motor models. And you can look in the manual or you can just call SEW Eurodrive customer service and order a DIM module if you need a different one. This is very interesting. You can actually run the Movimot without a DIM installed. You would do this if you were trying to control an older SEW motor that has been discontinued, like for example, the DT and DV series. These do not require a DIM module to control. You just leave it out and the Movimot knows that it's controlling an older motor and behaves accordingly. They do one other thing. Movimot has a mode called expert mode where you can parameterize it. The parameters are stored in the DIM. And this is handy because if the Movimot should fail for some reason or become damaged and you've parameterized it, you can take that DIM module out, put it in a new Movimot, replace your damaged one, and all the parameters will travel with it. So this can speed up doing maintenance. So those are DIM modules. All right, time for a demonstration. I've got my demo unit here. I'm going to show you how to remove the control head from the Movimot with my 8mm driver, and then I'll show you how to connect it up to power. All right, the first thing we need to do, of course, is wait that obligatory one minute for the capacitors to discharge. So I'm going to do that because I want to be absolutely safe and not get shocked. All right, our one minute is over. So now we can remove the control head. I'll take my driver and remove the four bolts in the corners and pop off the top. You can see here I've got my line connections already fed through the cable gland on the conduit box of the Movimot. We're going to connect up the three phases, L1, L2, and L3, to the labeled terminals inside the Movimot. I just put the wires underneath. These are stranded wires and there are ferrules on them, so I put them underneath here and then just tighten the three screws to the proper torque. The last thing we have to connect up is the protective earth or ground connection. The wire's already in place, but I do have to tighten the screw down. Note that this connection is in the conduit box. It's not on the main circuit board, so it's in a different location. And that takes care of wiring up my Movimot to power. So we're ready to go. Before we wrap up, I wanna talk very briefly about the older discontinued Movimots. Remember I said that we are now in the fourth generation, so there was an A version, a B version, and a C version. It's not too likely you'll see the A or B versions, but I do want to talk about the C version since there are still some in service. They look almost identical to the D version. They preceded it, of course. Now, what were they for? Well, they worked with our older DT and DV motor line, which has been discontinued for some time. They can't work with the newer SCW motors or they won't control them properly if you try to connect them up to one, so don't do it. I do want to emphasize they have nothing to do with the new Movi C line, even though the letter C is in it. That's an unfortunate overlap and it causes some confusion. So just remember, these are old Movi Mots, whereas Movi C is a brand new product line. How do you spot a Movimot C and differentiate it from a D since it looks very much alike? Well, very easily there is one glaring difference. There is no diagnostic port. There is only one plug on the top. It covers the F1 dial. There's no way to connect this up to a PC or a keypad. So that is how you tell it apart. If you see one port, it's an older one. If you see two ports, it's the new one, Movimot D. The control head is a bit different on a Movimot C if you look underneath it. First of all, there is no DIM module in it, so it can't be used with the newer motors. And also the dip switches are a little different and they're in a different position as well. And that's really all I have to say about the Movimot version C. And that is the end of session number two. In session number three, we will get ready to set up our Movimot in what's called easy mode. This is the mode that most people use and only takes a few minutes to get your drive ready to go. So see you then.